My name is Jerry Zion. I'm the global training manager for Fluke Biomedical and Race And uh, I'm not claiming that association with Landauer yet, but I have a good colleague that is doing the same thing for our Landauer group. Uh, you want to know more about that? Please come by the booth and we'll explain to you what we're doing, where we're going, because we're expanding like always, growing and doing everything like that. Today, what I want to talk together about is this idea of test instrument calibration process management. So in your quality system, your quality, your medical device quality assurance program, which may be more familiar for you to think about it in that way, it's all the same. There should be a, thank you. There should be a, uh, a section there where you manage keeping your test equipment calibrated and traceable all the way to SI, to VIPM. And some of you are nodding your head, so I know you know about this, and others of you, just some information may be new. Um, so I'm not going to stand up here as the expert, nor will Fluke say we are the expert, we are one of many who do this kind of work. There are lots of other calibration labs. My younger brother, for example, manages, uh, has managed the Transcat uh, calibration labs in the United States and Canada for many years. And um, he, can, he can snow me about metrology, believe me. But I want to have this discussion. So thank you all for showing up and showing up in such great numbers for this session. I was a little worried that it might be a little dry. So let's not make it dry, okay? Let's talk about the concept. Let's talk about and help each other, especially those that maybe think they may have a quality, a, a test instrument health program that's pretty good, and others of us that are, that are running what we think is world class. What I want you all to be able to do is take wherever you are, your current state, Explore what the future state can and should be and why, and then help the rest of your colleagues in your organization to move towards the future state, because that's where you're going to need to be at some point, at some point. <coughs> so um, let's get into it. So here's, when I was sitting down and thinking about, in every organization that I've worked in in my 40-year career, 10 years as hospital and department manager and director of biomed departments in three different hospitals, and then as I worked as a product manager and clinical specialist in many uh, OEMs, medical device manufacturers, um, calibration and metrology were really, really important. And as I was working, as I first came into Biomed in the 1970s, we knew we needed to keep our test instruments calibrated, and we sent them out at that time. There was no on-site cal. Um, so we sent them out for cal, but there were some issues with that, some things that needed to be managed. We needed to make a better plan about. So here's some of the things that, that I was thinking about. And as you read down through the list, we're going to go down and talk about each of these things, but as you read down through the list, if I've left something out that is really, really important, will you please raise your hand and, and share? Because I, there are some reasons that we're going to get into a little bit about why metrology really matters in medical device quality assurance in, for all kinds of medical devices, not just our critical and, and life support devices, but all of the medical devices that we're testing and what our part is in this unbroken chain of traceability, what that means. Okay. So we're going to introduce some concepts that some of you that are experienced know. You help me please, keep me honest. Let's get the right stuff going in the room in terms of the conversation. All right. so I'm going to lean on you as my group of experts. Okay. <laughs> so accuracy is really important, would you agree? <coughs> Why? You are calibrating the systems based on that tool. And if that tool is wrong, then your whole system is wrong. Exactly. And how does that impact the patient? Patient safety. 
and how. Let's let's talk a little bit about how it actually affects the patient. Even for things that are fairly low risk, it still can affect them. Proper delivery of Medication. medications and other therapies. Dose, absolutely dose. Very important dose. Um, in it, just to cite an example uh, on our imaging side, our racing side, for example, CT. Uh, in the last uh, two or three years, uh, CT overdose has become a problem, especially for head CT. And so the FDA even began weighing in more heavily on that, and the rest of the regulators <laughs> all about uh, 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 ionizing radiation. Weighed, have weighed in on that to get the manufacturers to make it a little harder to override the limits uh, without getting in the way of the, uh, of, the, of the need and the importance of having the physician able to get the job done for diagnosis or therapy. So, and but have everybody understand what that meant. And what I saw almost immediately really pleased me. Uh, many, many of the CT manufacturers improved their CT systems very quickly. Part of that was because a lot of what they needed to do was in software, so that was pretty quick. Uh, wasn't a lot of hardware requirement that had to be done. But in addition to that, there's the, the problem with defibrillators. And it's not so much the full ACLS <laughs> defibrillators, it's the AEDs. Since in, in the last five years, we've still got 60,000 incidents of failure of the AED just when you need it the most. And that's because we're not, by and large, not testing. More and more of us are. And we're trying to spread the word that you really need to and what you ought to look at when you're doing it. But, and how, because there was some, hey, I can't use the clinical battery. Okay, well, get over that. Let's just get another battery and let's make sure the device is functioning right. Um, so it was obvious that whatever was being done for testing wasn't enough to knock down those incidents which should have been able to be discovered before they failed in clinical use. And that's the whole deal. The accuracy of the measurement and that we have a quality system where we're looking at things, and often enough we're looking at the right things, really matters too. But the accuracy of the measurement is critical, especially if we take uh, something that's de delivering medication, an infusion pump, for example, and let's be very specific about a very high risk, obvious situation. The same infusion pump that may deliver D5 and water or normal saline and a little bit of a medication to a patient in pretty good shape may, in a half an hour later, be delivering chemotherapy to a cancer patient. And I don't know about you, but if I'm that cancer patient, I need that device to be accurate. I do not want to have an accidental overdose of that chemo. It's already making my hair fall out, right? It's already making me sick. I don't want any more effect like that. So sometimes it's good to walk in the shoes of the person you need to protect the most, and that's the patient. Tracking as found data. So what do I mean by that? How many have never heard of as found data, at least in that term? Well, so all of you have heard of it. Good for you. Now, do you understand how important and how to use it? Let me cast, uh, let me, let, give me an example of the importance of what you do with the as found data. There is a lot of times that so you could check if it's out of cow, mm -hmm. then now you could find if um, the equipment that you tested used to test other equipment, like uh, the ventilator, for instance. You can uh, see if um, back trace it. Now you got to check those equipment to make sure the accuracy of that ventilator delivering all different volumes or pressures. Exactly. If your as found data on your test instrument, or even on the medical device, by the way, my friends, but let's talk about the test instrument first. 
if the as found data is out of tolerance, then you have to immediately know that. So whoever's doing your calibration must tell you that it's out of tolerance. And then you have an action that you have to do. You have to go back all the way to the last calibration, the prior calibration, when that test instrument was within its tolerance. And technically, you have to repeat every single test. Okay, don't we already have enough work to do? Oh my gosh. But it's important that we do that because we do not know, none of us know, when it went out of tolerance. We can't tell. The data don't show us. So that's why you have that required. But there's one more thing too, best practice wise at least, and that is you have to cut the calibration cycle in half. So if it was once a year cal, it's now six months cal. And you have to be able to show that your test instrument remains in cal for two six month intervals before you can go back to the one year interval. That's the implication of the impact. So it's a lot more work than just making sure that you're staying in Cal and that you're and that you're uh, that you don't have to go back and repeat work that you've already done. Okay, because none of us are how many of you work in hospitals? Okay, this is even better. Thank you very much. If you're a medical, if you're only on part of a, a manufacturing company, it's very, very, very important as well, maybe even more. But it, who has time to do extra work? I don't, I never did. None of my staff did when I was in the hospital. So we're better off to keep it in cattle and follow the frequency of inspection. So keeping current is important. I don't know that these are in a particular pecking order, okay? Uh, priority order, we could probably reshuffle them and be happier with the list. But keeping current means if my test instrument cannot make a measurement that this medical device with this innovative functionality has, then I have a problem. I am not testing everything that I need to test. I cannot really do the measurement, the proper measurement, that the manufacturer is expecting me to do as listed in the service procedure in their uh, service menu. Let's talk about defibrillators again. You're aware, you are, are, are you not, that majority of the of the last two generations, anyway, of defibrillators have incorporated an impedance sensing circuit. I'll call it that, an impedance sensing functionality for the purpose of making sure that what you set is what you get no matter what the patient's actual impedance is. Transthoracic impedance varies, it's a variable, okay? Each of us are different to a certain extent. So if you look at the international standards about defibrillators, minimum performance and safety standards, I emphasize the word minimum, you will see that they require that each energy level that can be delivered by the defibrillator must be delivered across a series of test loads, not just one test load. I mean, we're all used to what? What's the test load for DFib that we're used to? Hmm? 50 ohms, that's what's built into most electric, uh, most defibrillator analyzers today. But it, there are some manufacturers that in the service procedure actually want to follow on with more than one test load uh, for each energy level. That means that testing takes a lot more time, and we may be tempted to maybe not do all that testing, just do it at 50 ohms and call it good. But you cannot, you cannot be sure that the function of that defibrillator as it's designed will meet its intended use if you don't present it with more than one test load. Okay, so let's say we don't know for sure if a defibrillator has that functionality built in, but it's pretty new. So how could we tell by the measurements that we make? If it has the sensing, no matter what resistance you set it at, it should still be very close to your energy delivery, where you not exactly. get variance. Exactly, and on one that does not have the functionality, what would we expect? We 
C variance based on the existing. We should actually we should see rather than a flat response, we should see a, a de decreasing response. Exactly. And it, it sounds simple, but if we don't test it, we don't know. Right? And how often should that functionality be tested? Well, there's a little room for decision about that. I'll tell you what, if you look at our training that, that we put in our advantage training center on this, the transfer uh, the um, human impedance variability topic is an application note, it's also a, um, a, a module. We talk about to be realistic about it because as I said, who has time to do extra tests? We suggest three different times in that case. First of all, incoming inspection. A really critical time to get to know that medical device technology and what it's intended to do and make sure that we can verify that it's, it's actually doing what it's supposed to. Second time is post repair of anything in the uh, measurement circuit, the de energy delivery circuit, including the battery, battery replacement, but certainly capacitor replacement, we certainly would need to look at it again, or any of the controls around those parameters. Third time, you get a call from the clinical unit, the doctor or the nurse <laughs> says, this defibrillator did not deliver its energy when we needed it to this patient. Failure in clinical use. Now what we want to do is know a little bit more about the patient in order to not necessarily have to test all of the test loads, but to try and bracket it the best that we can. So in that case, if we know the, um, I don't want to say just the BMI, the body mass index, but that would be a good start if we didn't have anything else to gauge kind of how big the patient is. Uh, I don't really care how much they weigh because muscle mass weighs more than fat mass, but if we if, if we can kind of get at least a sense of, then I want to know what energy level was dialed in when we had the failure. And I want to bracket again, test below and above and including that energy level. By knowing the BMI, I also can bracket a little bit, maybe the number of test loads that I need to use besides 50. By the way, 70 ohms is the new adult norm for, for transthoracic resistance. It's not 50 anymore. <laughs> but we haven't changed our test instruments to match up with that. It's okay. As long as we have the ability to test some other loads, we'll be fine. All right. So back to how does that tie back here, Jerry? Well, when we test the functionality, we need to make sure that the delivery is going to be accurate. Not only it delivers what you said is what you get, but that that output is accurate. Remember, the goal is not joules, although that's our measurement parameter. The goal is the current induced in the heart. That's the life-saving magic to depolarize all those cells or a fibrillating patient and let the, human, let the heart's own pacemaker get it back in sequence. That's really what we're trying to do clinically to keep it simple. The problem is it's not always that simple. But we at least need to make that measurement. The measurement matters. So if our, if our testing system does not allow us more than one load, we can't do the test. If we can't do the test, how do we know the accuracy? We do not. So keeping current means keeping your test instrument up to date with the innovations that are happening in the, in the medical device industry. Because sure enough, those, those innovations are going to come and they will come in your door and they will be in the medical devices in your hospital. Who's heard of um, Massimo Rainbow technology? Okay, who has patient monitors somewhere in the hospital that incorporate rainbow? Okay, so they're either going to occur there or they probably will occur in the emergency department first. They're not going to normally be in each of the trans, uh, trans, uh, transport patient monitors to move patients from point A to point B. They're going to be there for, criti for critical use. 
What in particular does rainbow help us find? Well, it can be related to that, but um, but it's even it's even more poignant than that, and, and we can point to perhaps a respiratory insult to begin with. All right. Uh, Think about firefighters, okay, and people caught in fires in buildings before they even get to our hospital. What's the one number one biggest risk and reason that patients die? Carbon monoxide poisoning, untreated carbon monoxide poisoning. Before that technology, that wonderful innovation called pulse co-oximetry, pulse co-oximetry we would have had to draw a sample of blood and get it to the nearest clinical laboratory, freestanding or not, that had a co-oximeter instrument. And we're talking about hours, not minutes. We have minutes. Who remembers their ACLS training or their cardiac <coughs> support training? How long can the brain go without oxygen? Three is the new four, yeah. <laughs> Exactly, because there's all kinds of brain injury that can occur. We don't want that to happen. So we need to have the people in the field, the paramedics and the fire department people and police department people or first responders to be able to have the capability to identify carbon monoxide poisoning. Pulse oximetry won't show you. So now we've got two wavelengths of light in pulse, ox pulse oximetry, but eight in mass and rainbow. A jump, a, a quantum leap in terms of innovation that occurred. Again, why we need to keep current. Why your functional tester, <coughs> why your functional tester for uh, for oximetry needs to be able to test mass and rainbow among other innovations. Another idea is measures through motion. We'll talk about that in a different, uh, different time. But so you see just a couple of examples here about why it becomes critical and why we can't just keep working with the same old test tools that I had in my shop when I was in the 1970s and first coming in. Can't do it. Be surprised if we can keep calibrating those things. Even though my company that I work for is in my DNA from the very beginning, from my days in the Navy, even before that. So Keep current. Traceability goes along with uh, accredited Cal certificates and uncertainties measurements. What is traceability? Just to the lab? Well, the lab, and then they have trace theirs back to the Exactly. So it is the test instruments that were used to calibrate your test instrument, and all the way back to the primary standard and actually all the way back to SI as managed by DIPM, okay? So we, I may get there in these slide sets, but I'd rather have the conversation whether we get through the end of the slide deck or not. Yes, we need to be traceable. And the measurements that we make on the medical device are therefore also need to be traceable. If, as we said, as you said, if our test instrument is not calibrated and traceable, then we have broken the chain, okay? And that's bad on, on, on all kinds of counts because how do we know that a centimeter is a centimeter, okay? We don't, unless we're all following the same transfer standards all the way down the line from the primary standard, right? There are all kinds of reasons for traceability across industries, but for us, it has to begin, it begin with reducing the risk to the patient by being able to follow exactly the manufacturer's specific uh, test procedures so that we can verify the calibration of the parameters that have spe specifications around them. Not only the units of measure, but the design functionality. Okay, so that's what we're talking about there. Um, what's the difference between any old report on calibration and accredited certificate report. What do you get from the places that you're getting your test instruments calibrated now? What are they giving you? A certificate. 
you're not giving you a report, guess where the uncertainties of measurement and your traceability are proven? In the report, not in the certificate. So right now, we're all getting away with it because, I'm sorry to put it in those terms, but I'm just trying to be kind of blunt. We're all getting away with it because our accreditation people, the people that come in and accredit us and audit us, aren't holding us to this yet. And I say yet. You need to understand that around the whole rest of the world, even in emerging <coughs> market countries in Brazil, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, are beginning where we will eventually get to. And that is requiring a certification of the biomed department as a calibration laboratory. Yes, because it's just, they, they feel and see that it's just that important to managing patient risk within their countries. The standards begin with ISO 9001. I'm sure you're all there, right? ISO 9001, all right? You may or may not need ISO 1345. We do in manufacturing and refurbishment. But you will eventually need ISO 17025, which is the one that gives us the specifics about these things. Sir. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I want to ask you a question about that because you said, I mean, we do get certificates from the calibration companies. Yes. But it's based on pass. And when something doesn't pass, we don't get the certificate until they fixed it. And then the report comes with. But you don't get, added. but you're not getting the as found data. Are they giving you as found data? Well, in a, in a sense, they are because they're saying why it did not pass. Right? I mean, if everything passes, then that meets the standard, right? That meets the standard because it's a pass, no pass. All of the certification people that I've done with this group, it's either pass no or no pass. It's a pass, no pass. Do they see what's their criteria for the pass is a question. This, because I agree with you otherwise. Okay, that's okay. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Right? The standard should, should be that we should get the actual numbers that show that it's in compliance with the standard. And the uncertainties of measurement for each parameter and it's not just one or two parameters for a test instrument, by the way, it's all the parameters that that test instrument measures, all right? And any of us who are manufacturing test instruments with multiple parameters to make it easier for you to do your job, actually complicate that a little bit because it really does have to be about all of those parameters, not just one or two. And I run into this in, the, in, in mostly in the emerging market also. You have a Cal lab that is certified for volts and ohms and amps, but they're not certified for any of the rest of the functionality, let's say in pressure measurement or temperature measurement or anything like that. And they're saying, oh, but my National Institute of Metrology has certified me as a certified lab, yes, for volts, ohms, and amps, but not for the rest. And they don't. So we're trying to help everybody understand this is a global community based on a treaty, not a treaty, I'm sorry, not a treaty, but an international agreement that began in 1875 with 14 signatories from 14 nations on that document. And the signatories for uh, as the as instrumentation explodes into the rest of the world we're gaining more and more every single year right and these emerging market countries are looking and they're saying why what's important here why is it important yes we probably should do that and taking control and making sure that it happens at a faster pace than we are here in the u.s partly because a lot of us don't understand it thank thank god so many of you in this room do at least understand it at at least the basic level. So here's what I'm trying to do is raise the consciousness about this. Certainly Fluke thinks it's important. Yes, sir. So if we go ISO 9000 standards, that means we have to be in an environment that's climate controlled, 60 degrees, low humidity. We have to acclimate all the test equipment 24 hours before we start measuring it. Well, so temperature changes yeah. measurement. Right. So there, there are, there's the hairy details about how you get 
So ISO 9000 really says, number one, you have to have a quality system, a quality management system. That's what it really says, what's really impactful to us. The next thing that it says is you need to have some controlled environment. Here's why that's important. I went to Thailand. We just introduced our new incubator analyzer, and I went to Thailand, and we had a metrologist in the room from their, their national NMI who was very well checked out, a very, very intelligent young man. And we had in the back of the room a hospital way away from the major cities without any climate control. The climate control was, is it raining today? Okay, there's a high humidity. Is it hot today? Yeah, well, it's hot everywhere, including everywhere in the hospital. Okay, one of the tests that has to be done on an infant incubator is the warm-up time test. It has to rise 11 degrees C in a specific amount of time in order for that incubator to be deemed functionally safe and, and, and ready for use. They can't perform it. There's not 11 degrees between their, their ambient temperature and the rise time temperature. There's no way that they can perform that test if they're trying to do the test exactly to the standard. So there's a thousand and one little details that are very hairy that really have to be managed one way or another. Is your department at least air conditioned in a normal way? No. no. Okay. I mean, we're at sea level. I know people in Colorado, it's totally different when they do events. And yeah. Like that, yeah. I would like to get into so it standard. I mean, yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> that, would, that would be wonderful because it helps manage um, uh, humidity as well as temperature. Um, so that all works for us. Uh, the barometer, thank God, some of us that make test equipment put a barometer inside the unit so it knows where it is. It knows where it is to enough to be able to do the testing appropriately. So yes, but you're right. If we, but if we don't look at those things, if we just blindly say, well, I can use this help service, this lab, and they kind of do it, they can use a certificate, I'm probably good. For now, for now. But I challenge you to begin thinking about how you can do it better without breaking the bank and without taking an inordinate amount of time running your tests. Just paying attention to some things like get the S found data, make sure you're getting it. And by the way, you're the consumer. Do you not realize you have the right to tell us how much you're going to pay? Do you think we might adjust? Yeah? I know you've had less uh, success with some of the medical device manufacturers that you're getting service keys and things like that for some of the test instruments to be able to do your job. But believe me, you will be paid attention to. You will be. You just gotta make sure you're joining together and making a big enough voice, okay? A big enough voice. And it's really important to your patients, as we've already pointed out, all right? Really important as far as that goes. So that covers traceability, accredited uh, reports that have the uncertainties of measurement. Part of 17025 is whoever is doing the calibration verification must have created and calculated their budget of uncertainties of measurement. Typically, there are things that we cannot control. They remain variables no matter what we do. But we have to we have to put that in perspective of how accurate is it really? How accurate is that measurement really that we just did? So let me blow through this a little bit. We all agree accurate is important, but who's who are shooters in here? Who shoots? whether it's guns or bows and arrow, whatever it is. Okay, good, so we have a few of you. So you get the difference between a nice tight pattern that's simply not on the bullseye compared to a bunch of things that happen again in the bullseye versus something where we've got a nice tight pattern right where it needs to be, right in the bullseye. That's what we want. Our measurement uncertainties are not significant uh, to keep us from having both accuracy and precision of the measurement of the parameter, whatever it is. Let's take a look at it another way. Here's 
uh, some temperature measurements with some errors around the central parameter that we want. All right. In this case, we're measuring zero degrees C. So each of these have, you know, some some variation in terms of where they are. Even without the uncertainties, would you agree these two measurements right here might end up drifting out of tolerance during the calibration cycle if we're not careful? Yeah. So I mean, I would have already reacted to these two, but how about with the uncertainty brackets around them now? These are, including your uncertainties, this is the positive error and this is the negative error. These three, these two plus this one and maybe this one need some help. And I probably won't put that device back into clinical use without a corrective action. Oh, there's something else we're talking about. What's your definition of calibration? <coughs> the official definition of calibration in the glossary of terms from, from, metro, from the metrology uh, agreement is the verification of the measurement compared to the to the standard, the primary or transfer standard. That verification is what's critical. And when we see a problem with that verification as part of our analysis of what we see compared to the primary, then we have basically got a, 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 a reason for a corrective action, which is the adjustment or the repair and retesting of that instrument and for that parameter. You understand? Calibration does not mean the adjustment. It means the verification measurement. That's what it means. Now we have, believe me, I grew up thinking it was the adjustment too. Okay, I, I really did. So when you look at this, this needs some corrective action because I'd rather have it tighter here within the tolerance bars, okay? And if I'm doing a medical device, it's the same thing as if I'm just looking at my test instrument when I send it out for count. Okay, so we happen to have a really great example of a, a limited traceability path here um, that, that I'm just gonna demonstrate. This is a safety analyzer. It measures DC volts among other parameters. We're just going to look at DC volts for a minute. From the primary standard, which we have at Loop, we have the ability and do create the, D, the primary DC volt. And we're audited all the way back to SI as to how the care and feeding of this device, this um, the, uh, array that by which we create that DC volt. We put that into a transfer standard. We use it to calibrate our our big calibrator, which is used to calibrate our safety analyzer for DC <coughs> volts. So the parameter is DC volts. The total uh, uncertainty of measurement here is 50 microvolts per volt of measurement. Pretty, but pretty nice, less than 0.1%. But here's the uncertainty budget. And I know you can't read this. What I'm hopeful to find or biomed departments that, that are not like you in the room where you have some experience with this. A simpler way to do a basic determination of uncertainties. Because the other part of 17025 is that you will include your uncertainties of measurement in your report about the medical device that you just calibrated. Now, Today, nobody's looking over your shoulder for this. In the future, they will because the rest of the world will. And people who come here to practice medicine or come here from other parts of the world will bring that expectation with them. And that alone will begin to move, the, move us towards this requirement for certification for our labs. So again, my purpose here is to raise awareness, not to call you out for any of this stuff. 
you know where your gaps are going to be, and then just go take a look at them. Talk to each other about them. <clears throat> if you need more expertise, there are a lot of people with great expertise around metrology that can help with this. If you'd like our help, we certainly will find a way to help you with it. Okay? Because it, it certainly matters to us. It certainly matters to us. And we're also, like you, working on making sure we can deliver to you within your expectations on certainties of measurement in a complete Cal report, a credit Cal report. Okay. You can get it now, but it does cost extra. So just, again, just to raise the awareness a little bit. Where you said that if he has a device that fails, uh -huh. are you recommending that if, if you do have one that fails the calibration, then you do a 17 to 025 cal on it? So you've got those? Well, that's one approach. That's one approach, Greg. I, 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 uh, I, no, I'm not, I'm going to be non judgmental here. I, I, I think that's exactly why we want to have conversations like this and talk to each other about what we're doing in the line and what's going to fly and what's not going to fly. It's not me, the judge, it's the auditor that's going to be the judge, okay? And um, and as we said right now, the hospitals are not audited in 17025. But those of us that are running an authorized calibration laboratory certainly are, are we not? Right, and it matters. It matters. And right now we get to take credit for, if we're doing it completely and doing it right, we can go talk about that to our customers. But it's just important, I want you to remember, it's not just about a certificate that says, yeah, it looked good. And an interpolation table that says, when you make a measurement about this parameter, by the way, you've got to look at this table to evaluate what you saw in your test instrument that I just calibrated for you. Excuse me. Is the table sufficiently detailed so I don't have interpolation error now? That adds to my uncertainty. So you're assuming that the calibration lab, whoever is using, is that their equipment is accurate. Yep, and traceable and has uncertainties. That's my point raise the awareness. Let's make sure we're calling for and expecting better performance from whoever's doing our calibration. And we have to include ourselves when we say a comment like that, don't we? Absolutely we do. Absolutely we do. So I'm having the same conversation inside as I'm having outside. Okay. Here's, here's that path, and you can see now more of the uncertainties from our Josephson's array points. So this is an example, all right? I'm not selling you on our calibration. I'm giving this as an example. From 0 0.02 microvolts per volt to 50 microvolts per volt at the end of the calibration at the factory, and if our depot service when you send it to our authorized lab to do Cal, should be the same, then we're, we're in pretty good shape as long as you get that report that includes the uncertainties of measurement for every parameter and discloses all of the test standards, transfer standards that were used for the calibration of your device when it was in the Cal. Right? Any disagreement from those of you that have great experience in this? Am I on track? Sir? I just noticed when I use code to calibrate my equipment and everything, uh -huh. it doesn't, I do as before. Uh, mm -hmm. But when I get the report, it doesn't seem like they achieve nominal. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm worried about the cumulative error mm -hmm. with me checking it. And we all know that transducers are correct. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we achieve nominal so the next time we do check it, it's still in tolerance? But, they didn't drift out of tolerance. Right, but what affects? <clears throat> this this idea of nominal. It's the design of the of that part of the device. Am I, am I not correct? Correct. <clears throat> you can design for more stability rather than less. You can pick components that drift more less than than more with other comparative components. And when you discover in your design that the 
component you thought was really stable and going to work really well does not, then you have to, if you're the manufacturer, you certainly have to <clears throat> go back and rethink the components because by now a new component may be available that is much more stable and give the ability to be much more accurate. Okay, so those are some of the things that we deal with all the time. All the time. Sir? One thing that's a little opaque here, and if you don't mind, I'm, I'm, my example is, a measurement um, needs to be only as precise as it really needs to be. This this discussion of nominal, mm -hmm. 5.0 with seven zeros is obviously precise, but if you are using the measurement mm -hmm. as just five, with mm -hmm. no zeros, um, the actual precision actually causes you trouble. There are expectations. So let me give you a little bit more information about what, what we're thinking, okay? If you ask any metrologist what, how much more accurate the test instrument should be than the device, they will tell you 10. It's 10 times more accurate. If, if any manufacturer of test equipment brings you a test device that is 10 times more accurate, do you know what the price tag will be? You will not be able to afford it. And we get it. So what we're doing is manufacturing for the, the intended use by the intended people who will use the device. And we're still keeping to four, four times more accurate. And there's some, uh, there's some ties back to the calculation of uncertainties that support that, that support that, which is kind of to the point of what you're talking about. But I don't think you're going to find a time when it's just going to be the, 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 the uh, one digit. Okay. It won't. It's always going to be more than that. Sir. I, I have to, I have to just say that for me. I had the state of Oregon recertify my 450 pound weights, seven decimals, wow. zero. And what am I using it for? To check a patient's scale that has plus or minus 10%. Right. Yes, right. And, and that report may actually cause you trouble the next time. The next time, the right, because it's time. not then then it's out of power. Right, exactly. Then it's out of power, and then you have to go back. Right. The so example. You, you see how valuable these discussions can be? Exactly yeah. right, okay. Exactly. So, <laughs> There, there's realistic expectations and there's a bit unrealistic uh, expectations. Just, what was the quote? Just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing? Yeah, I like that quote, okay? I at least heard it in Duke. Okay. <laughs> All right, terrible point of, point of reference. <laughs> but, uh, but, but yes, yeah, so it's the point. So. More conversations in the community will help us sort out those details. The Cal Lab is a set of metrologists who are doing what they're able to do and very proud of what they're doing. It's great, but it can cause some difficulties. So we need to have a conversation, I think. There's a point of realistic expectation, is where I think we want to get to. Okay, so. Uh, I'm actually finished with this part of it. Um, anything else that we should have touched on that we did not? Here's something that you mentioned, which is a very good point here, is what are the capabilities of your Cal Lab as far as a 17025? If they, a Cal Lab can say, I'm 17025 if I get one accreditation. We do all of That's it. That Resistance. goes back to the point of across how many parameters. Yeah. Is it enough to do my test instrument, yes or no? So the where you find that information is, first of all, you should obtain your certificate. Their 17025 certificate. Mm -hmm. Well, some companies claim compliance mm -hmm. versus certified. Mm -hmm. Compliance means, yeah, I say I'm doing it. Certified means somebody independent came in and done that. Mm -hmm. If you look at their scope, and if they have a scope that's only two or three pages, I can pretty well guarantee you they do not. <laughs> There's not many things they do. All right. right. The other thing you want to look at as well is their lab may be 1702 certified, but are they also certified to do on site? Does that 17025 follow them? Very good point. Many places, yeah, the lab is, the on site is not. So those are a couple of things that 
it's important to look at, I think, yeah. when you're choosing your calibration supply. Exactly. And what's the what's the workaround? What workaround do they recommend? If they admit that their on-site service is not certified, and they find a discrepancy, by the way, in any case, they should be giving you that stock data. I'm sorry, they just have to do that. That's just got to be a requirement. But let's say, because you've got to have some basis to make your decision on about the test instrument. So if, if, if you find a failure, now how do they help you mitigate that? All right, because you're going to now, you absolutely need the certified report. You need the certified report. Can they do the corrective action? Okay. There are reasons why we lock down and only uh, approve uh, authorize certain labs, not any old lab, just to this point. Because unless they are kept up to date on changes in hardware and firmware in the device that they're calibrating, they cannot do the full uh, corrective action. And they might be able to do the re-verification, but they cannot do the corrective action. So what are you paying for? Or what are you getting for what you're paying for? Those are really important things if I'm the consumer. Okay, if I'm the consumer, those are critical. Okay, your car goes in the shop because you have a problem with your speedometer or something that's going to affect it. Ah, tires. Did you know that the size of your tire can affect the accuracy of your speedometer and the air pressure? All right. What are your expectations as a consumer? All right. So you get that ticket and you go back and say, what the hell? Well, what are they going to do about it? Probably nothing. Is it critical to life and death? No, but it costs you more money because you have to pay the fine. Right? How hefty? Depends on how fast you're going over the speed limit. <laughs> so it all matters and it all plays together. You see, that's what I'm trying to say. And raise the awareness and start the conversation. So have this conversation within your departments, within your biomedical organizations. Right? Have the conversation with your Cal laboratory. Set your expectations. And do it with us too. We don't get off this stuff free in any case. We're not special. We're part of what needs to be delivered so you can do your job right and the patient stays safe. That's the bottom line. Greg, your point. I, I got a speeding ticket and it's been 20 years ago. And I was convinced that I was not going as fast as he clocked me. And I went as far as put my car on a dynamometer. Dynamometer? Yeah. And it was off. And it, I'm kind of one of these guys that I'll go right under, you know, what I think that they're going to pick at you at. Yeah. And that a couple miles per hour got me. Yeah. I ended up having to pay, but you know, it could save my insurance. Yeah. Back to this. That's exactly what it's. Okay. <laughs> if that wasn't a speedometer problem, but it was an infusion pump delivering chemotherapy, low. Okay, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. Well, that, in that same case, and just like you're talking about with the struggle, is uh, given, given the instance of the speeding, that um, the, to say that you're speeding, well, what you used to measure my speed was that accurately calibrated and you deserve you have the right to know that you have the right to ask that and be shown before you spend your money actually when you schedule your services that certificate by the way would also have to have a strict uh, escape of traceability that's i mean it's the local if it doesn't it's qualified that the people don't right So I'm sure you all get it from what happens if the failure was on in, during clinical use and an injury actually happened or a death actually happened to the patient. 
now we get into the realm of medical legal responsibility and liability. And you will be asked by the plaintiff attorney for evidence that you did your job, right? I have seen it go there. Now, who's been deposed or part of an uh, investigation into an incident? A few of you. So you already know how uncomfortable it is just with the deposition, right? Imagine if you go to court, and that's why a lot of times your hospitals sell out of court. That's never cheap. Remember what it says on the certificate? It says it's only as good as it was when it did the test. Thankfully, we have that disclaimer. Nevertheless, we still have a responsibility to do our very best, make our best effort, okay? Please, that's our real job. That's what we're really here for. Now, I've spent my career, this has been my life's work, okay? To, to make sure medical devices were actually doing what they say that they're gonna do, to make sure that we were serving the needs of the doctor and the nurse who's taking care of patients and now taking care of all of you to help you take care of the doctor and nurse. The customer of our, of our customer, that's you, is our customer, right? All the way to the patient. We have that responsibility. So at least I, for one, and I'll just speak for myself, that's how serious I take this and how seriously it is to me. I've been the patient. I've been the patient in the OR, open heart. I've been the patient in the cath lab. I've been the patient in the med surge bed, the kid who had double pneumonia, okay? I've been the car accident vi victim in an oxygen tent because it was before we had real ventilators. That's way back. So it's important to me. My grandson was in an infant incubator for the first three weeks of his life simply because he was born at a higher altitude, his lungs didn't mature quite as fast as they could. It was a little premature. So we had a little surfactant treatment going on based on what? The information that we got from the medical devices that were used along with the five senses of skilled clinicians to diagnose what was going on with him and how serious it was. Today, he's running around, he plays soccer, he's just doing great. He's almost six, and I can't keep up with him anymore. <laughs> that's what I want for everybody, okay? That's really what I want for everybody. That's what I have for you today. Thank you very much, I'm serious. What a great turnout for a topic like this. And I hope that we made it interesting for you to participate in, and you come back and see us some more. Go to our Advantage Training Center, take some courses, tell me what we're missing, I'll add them in. Um, one of the things you'll, that you'll be seeing from us as soon as I can get it is this will become part of a course involved in our medical device quality assurance about why metrology matters. And um, that's promised to me from me to you. How quickly I can get there, I hope I get there before the end of the year, but it might be take me a little bit longer. All right, thanks again. Thank you.